With its five-story steel frame and masonry infill exterior wall, the Digester Building is the most prominent of the remaining brick structures at the former pulp mill site along Bellingham's waterfront. The Port of Bellingham purchased the site several years ago for redevelopment purposes. While collectively the industrial complex was deemed eligible as a National Register Historic District, significant buildings on site have been demolished. In 2004, there were 50 buildings on the site. Those buildings have gradually been destroyed. Last year, three more buildings were taken down. At this point, there are only five buildings remaining, four buildings from the pulp mill and the agricultural granary. The port, with the city of Bellingham as a project partner, continues to move forward with its waterfront development plans. These buildings could form a discrete district. They tell a good portion of the story of how pulp was made. I'd like to see the port take the character of the site and work with design standards that would cultivate the character of the brick mill buildings. This is one of the last remaining sites in Washington State to tell a story of regional significance. People in Bellingham are excited about where they live. We feel like our city has a real distinct character and this site, which is part of local history, could contribute to the narrative of the city in a significant way if these buildings are adaptively reused and preserved. The Haller House provides a rare example of an early residential structure from Washington's territorial period. We nominated the Haller House because by some miracle the house has not ever um, been modernized. There's no central heating, there's no pl real plumbing, there's very marginal wiring. So there's a lot that we can learn from this house that we probably can't learn from any other house in western Washington. The house's namesake, Colonel Granville Haller, also plays a prominent role in our nation's history. A career military man, Colonel Haller fought in several wars, including the Pig War on San Juan Island and the Civil War. After being relieved of his duties during the Civil War, Haller returned to Puget Sound, constructing his house in downtown Coopville. There's so many interpretive opportunities through Haller just to look at the Civil War and how it impacted people living here in Western Washington. Vacant since 2006, the house is presently listed for sale. When well-intentioned hopes to see the house preserved and interpreted as a historic resource fell through, the current owners were forced to put it on the market. The vision for the friends of the Haller House is that the house is restored for use as a public interpretive educational place. And with a house like this, 1866, they're not making any more of them. We can't recreate this opportunity to save the story that came with this house. The first settlers of Gig Harbor were largely Croatian immigrants who made a living as fishermen. Being primarily Catholic, construction of a Roman Catholic church was an early and important goal for the community. In late 1913, a half acre of land was purchased for $300 and donations collected from the canneries and fishermen's supply houses provided the money needed to build the church. In 1958, a larger church, parish hall, and school were constructed on site to accommodate the expanding parish. Plans are currently under consideration to expand the 1958 facilities, yet no mention of the 1914 church has been included in the discussion. I know that our goals in our parish are changing as we now have a Catholic school on campus, and there are needs for bigger facilities and current facilities. In the absence of clear communications about the fate of the old church, parishioners and community members have expressed a deep concern for its future, including the fear of potential demolition. What I would like to see happen is that the parish as a whole, with the council and the, all the parishioners and the community of Gig Harbor, come to a decision about what the future for this building is. How can we celebrate its history? I want to read you a quote from our restoration process in 1980 when this church was facing demolition to make a bigger parking lot. The mayor said, that we had an historical value here and we should have successful attempts at saving the building. It's a monument for the entire town, not only a church building. And a fisherman, John Gillich, told the church council, it's a symbol of the spirit of this town. You tear it down and the spirit is gone.
The electric building in downtown Aberdeen opened to the public in 1913 as the crown jewel of its owner, the Grays Harbor Railroad and Light Company. With its design, architect C. E. Troutman had achieved a unique commercial building featuring Beaux-Arts terracotta detailing and an elaborate illumination design gracing the outside of the structure. This building is unique because it's a one-of-a-kind treasure. It's illuminated with a couple thousand electric light bulbs on the exterior. It's known as the electric building and it really symbolizes an age and a heritage and a great optimism. Like many of the early buildings in Aberdeen's downtown core, the upper stories of the electric building remained essentially abandoned following the depression, resulting in severe deferred maintenance today. But hope persists. New owners envision a day when they can turn the lights back on. Looking at the cost between leasing and ownership, uh, I actually purchased the building cheaper than what I was leasing my other building for. In the long run, it's a good financial decision. And they have the full support of city officials who understand that rehabilitated historic resources serve as a strong catalyst for downtown revitalization. And this is really important for the city of Aberdeen because it sits on a primary corner in our downtown. And we want to see it relit. We want to bring the community together once again and have a building that we really treasure. With festivities to celebrate the electric building's centennial anniversary planned for later this year, it is hoped the lights will be on in no time. We're keying this as the future as well. Past is present, present is future. And we're pinning a lot of hopes, a lot of hard work, dedication on this particular facility. The Battelle Tolaris campus in Seattle's Laurelhurst neighborhood is significant to the city and the region as a fine example of modern architecture that succeeded in blending buildings and landscapes in an environmentally responsive manner. Initially developed in the late 1960s, the site first served as the Seattle campus of the Battelle Memorial Institute. With Battelle's departure in 1997, the campus served as home to the Tolaris Institute. The institute relocated in 2012, and while the site still operates as a conference center, the future of the campus remains uncertain. Concern for the site prompted neighbors to form the Friends of Battelle Tolaris. Along with other stakeholders, they are working with the owners on a plan to develop the property in a manner sensitive to the historic landscape and structures present at the site. What's fulfilled here is a site that has a balance between the open space and the developed land. And there's a concern for how best to maintain the balance that's here now. The story that these buildings and the site can provide in terms of how to develop sustainably and how, do you, how to develop compatibly within a neighborhood it could be lost with the loss of those structures. If you look behind me, it, it's almost as though it's a Japanese woodblock print with the angles of the buildings and the willow trees. We'd like to be involved in creative thinking about ways to sustain the property. It's such a beautiful place and much of the beauty for me is the way the landscape outlines and hides and reflects the building and vice versa. It's like a piece of art. Because the Northwest has such a bountiful beauty, there's a respect for the natural environment that you don't find in many areas. In practice, think in terms of what is a healthful environment. That's a lesson we can all benefit from. In the 1860s, under the direction of acting Indian agent Major John Sims, the government constructed a log cabin in Chihuahua to serve as the Colville Indian Agency. Sims and his wife lived in the cabin until 1882, and shortly thereafter, the agency was moved to Fort Spokane. In 1902, Dr. S. P. McPherson purchased the cabin as his personal residence, and family descendants continued to own and occupy the property until 2010. Between 18... 73 and 1882 it served as the Indian agency for this entire region that's 26,000 square miles and nearly 4,000 Native Americans. The Stevens County Historical Society recently took over ownership and stewardship responsibilities of the cabin with the goal of opening it as a museum to interpret the Indian agency period. But as repairs began additional needs emerged. They had put concrete around the bottom to seal out the skunks. They had placed dirt underneath the floorboards to keep the rodents out of it. But at the same time, it held in the moisture. The moisture got into the wood. The sill logs rotted. 
So our goals change to keeping it from falling down. It will not stand unless the sill logs are replaced. In addition, there are significant archaeological considerations for the site. This whole site is a potential archaeological treasure. So I, I'm very excited to have both the Kalispells and the Spokane tribal archaeologists working on the project with us. In the meantime, anxiety remains over the extent of rehabilitation work required to stabilize the cabin. This site really is one of the few buildings still standing from territorial days. It's just a really important part of the, the history of the Northwest. This could be a place that we can educate. It is a place that we can bring people together. We've had some wonderful moments already. B. D. Mukai and his wife, Kuni, arrived on Bashan Island with goals of achieving the American dream. The home they built in 1927, a typical rural farmhouse, symbolizes these aspirations. Soon after, Kuni, wishing to retain a link to their ancestral land, designed a traditional Japanese garden at the site. Together, the house and garden represent the blending of two cultures. The garden landscape is especially notable as the only known Japanese garden of this era designed by a woman. The husband, Bidi Mukai, is very significant in his own right. He created and developed the largest strawberry distribution service at the time. Over 12 years ago, a local nonprofit utilized state and county funds to acquire the property with the mandate of maintaining the site, providing public access, and interpreting the Mukai family story. Since that time, the capacity of the organization to provide the required stewardship for the site has been called into question. Local advocates have engaged in legal efforts and are preparing long-term stewardship plans. A group of islanders started a new organization called Friends of Mukai. We want to be ready to help do whatever we can to save the property. We just want to see the original promise of the property realized. The state, meanwhile, has made inquiries to determine if compliance with the terms of an easement in place for the property have been met. And our hope is to have an educational program, first of all, to have a cultural interpretation center, and to use a very small portion of the property here to recreate some of that farming. There are a lot of people on the island who care about it, have watched it decline over the last 10, 15 years. Our ultimate goal is to have it be a community resource. So it's really frustrating because it was public money that was used to buy it. There's so much potential for this place. It could be such an amazing community resource.